Hey everyone and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is The Daily Show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well greetings and salutations everybody and Happy Thanksgiving to all of my uh, Canadian brethren. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Why are you laughing? I I'm no so glad idea. you decided to join us. I on thought this on Twitter. That's the only reason why I understood. Canadians, uh, Thanksgiving. What's going on? Yes, <laughs> I thought it was a strictly American thing where we be. like sh sh you know, j j you know, shafted the Indians. I can't even speak. Also here, <laughs> back like, is John Schnepp. Hey everyone, uh, it was great. Manhattan was also part of the bargain where we jacked over everybody. Um, um, but I was happy to be there. Uh, New York Comic Con, all the movie talk sweaties. It was great to hang out. It was it was so jam packed. I barely made it around because people were just walking like this the whole time. It was it was a madness, but so much fun. So. Also here, Mark Ellis. I thought we were pre-recording a Thanksgiving episode. <laughs> like, let's just talk about news stories and see if they work out to be in late November. Well, hey, listen, folks, <laughs> as happens sometimes after we get the show notes all done, another piece of news drops. And this is a significant one. According to our friends over at JoeBlow.com, they have claiming to have now insider information that the upcoming Marvel film Thor Ragnarok will indeed star Thor, but will also feature the Hulk. According to the website, they say that the majority of the film will happen on a planet that is neither Asgard nor Earth, but a third planet that has a lot of people speculating, could this be liken unto World War Hulk. That's what some people are talking about right now. Now, we got to say and, and put this giant asterisk on here. We are not claiming the validity of this story. This is coming from JoeBlow.com, which in my experience has been a fairly reliable site. They're a reputable website. So whether this is true or not is still up in the air. We haven't heard any official confirmation from anybody. This just dropped this morning. But for the sake of discussion, let's go on the assumption for now that this is really valid. This is completely valid. What do you think about this news dropping that we're going to see Hulk in Thor Ragnarok? Well, it's, it's exciting. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, some of my favorite uh, fights when I was a little kid was Hulk fighting Thor. And so it was really fun to see, even in the Avengers, even if it was only for a few minutes, them go toe to toe. So that was awesome. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if it's a different planet, could it be planet Hulk? I mean, could it be like they're like setting the seeds for that and they're going to mix the whole Planet Hulk storyline with Surtur and Ragnarok and the sword and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, it's exciting. And if he's going to be, it, it makes sense to me. Like maybe they couldn't fit the Hulk with the other 800 characters who are in Civil War, <laughs> but like they can fit him in with Thor. So it makes sense. Oh, it is a lovely Thanksgiving day indeed when you hear this kind of news. Because like one of my favorite things about the Avengers Age of Ultron is how they played with the relationship between Thor and Hulk. You didn't get too much of it, but from that first movie onto the second movie, they you could tell they worked on their chemistry a little bit. Like, hey, we're both superheroes, we're both Avengers. You get a little crazy when you turn green, but we're still going to be somewhat buddies. So this furthering that, when you're going into Ragnarok, which is the Norse apocalypse, so you're going to need all the help you can get. The distant planet thing is very intriguing and I'll give credit to Joe Blow here because the way that they speculated on what could that could mean for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was very intriguing because as they pointed out that movie will come out after Guardians of the Galaxy mm -hmm. 2 so I yeah. wonder if there's going to be any hints to that in Guardians 2 another thing that they said in that article was that Tom Hiddleston is also going to be making an appearance yes in Thor Ragnarok which is great news all around so this sounds awesome to me okay see this <laughs> That's my surprise face that Tom Hiddleston might be in Thor Ragnarok. Right. Shock. Uh, <laughs> worst kept secret, secret knowledge. This makes sense on a lot of levels. I mean, Kate, first of all, remember back at that big announcement that Disney did at the El Capitan Theater, I'm announcing the phase three lineup, stuff like that. At that event that Mark and I were both actually physically at, somebody asked Kevin Feige about Hulk. We're going to see standalone Hulk movies. And one of the things that Kevin Feige says, say, he said, we're probably not going to see standalone Hulk movies. He goes, but... Trust me, Hulk is going to be an integral part of Phase 3 and what goes on. He also said the same thing about Black Widow. And so far, we're seeing Black Widow and everything. So this makes sense because we know we're not going to see Hulk in Civil War, which also kind of makes sense because there is no Civil War if Hulk is in Civil War. Which side's the Hulk on? That's the side you put your money on. That's the side that wins. <laughs> right. um, so this makes a lot of sense. Also, getting more into the whole cosmic stuff, Thor could use Hulk. 
He, like, you're right. The chemistry that they've been building up between Thor and Og has been great. You almost seem a, a camaraderie. Right from that first fight they had on the Helicarrier, which was one of my favorite moments of the first Avengers, and then this picture is one just a second or two before one of my funniest moments in Avengers when they're sitting there like, yeah, they just beat the crap out of these guys, and then Hulk, boom, and then sends a fly. Like, that was such a great moment. This, to me, makes sense. I think it would it would uh, further the story along a lot. You got to have somebody fighting alongside Thor. I have no doubt we're going to see, like, uh, Lady Sif in there. We're going to see all the other, you know, the other, his, his the Warriors 3 there. Yeah. I'm sure all that. But mixing in a Hulk mixes up the Thor standalone films a little bit more. I think it's great. So here's hoping that it's actually true. All right, let's get to the first official story for the day. All right, it's Monday, which means it's time for our weekly box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one for the second week in a row is the Matt Damon film The Martian. The film took in an additional $37 million to bring its two-week total up to $108.7 million domestically, roughly the same as its production costs, $227 million worldwide, and only dropped 32% from its opening weekend. Coming in second spot for the second week in a row is the annual animated film Hotel Transylvania 2, making $20.3 million. In the number three position is the Peter Pan film Pan, making just $15.5 million on its opening weekend, well below its reported $150 million production budget. In fourth place is the Robert De Niro and Hathaway comedy The Intern, making an additional $8.8 million, crossing the $100 million worldwide mark. And rounding out the top five is Sicario, making $7.5 million. John, what stands out to you in this week's box office report? Uh, Two things would stand up to me. First of all, we'll go with the positive stuff, which is the Martian. Martian only, look, we say in here, hey, if a movie can drop like 45%, that's a great number. You don't want to see the 55 to 60% range. 32% drop. That is great word of mouth. That is great marketing. That is just the sign of a great movie. And The Martian is completely a great movie. If you haven't seen The Martian yet, I don't think any of us at this table can recommend it highly enough. Just go out and see The Martian. But, I, I mean, the story here is the unmitigated, no way around this, you can't play with words, flop, uh, that is Pan. A $150 million film that lands $15 million. Now, about a week and a half ago, the numbers started to look grim. They knew this movie wasn't going to open strong. They were projecting it to hit around the mid-20s, and it came in even lower than that. This, look... Hugh Jackman is fantastic. Peter Pan is a beloved franchise. Visually, the film looked really interesting. Something completely turned audiences off of wanting to go see this thing. Like something made, there was a bunch of small things that would turn a couple of people off, but something turned the larger movie going audience in mass off. I can't really put my finger on what that was, but I mean, the 15 million, this is a. This is this is the type of result that could sink smaller production companies. They would just sink them anyway. Mark, what stands out to you about the? Uh, box what stands office? out to me is the fact that uh, almost double the amount of people that saw Pan decided to see Fantastic Four that opening weekend, <laughs> and we talked about how bad that movie was. Mm. So I can't imagine what Pan is like. I didn't get a chance to see Pan. It didn't really appeal to me, and it appeals. It appears like nobody else really wanted to see it either because I think that maybe they didn't know what audience it was for. Was it for kids or was it for adults trying to recapture some? youth where something like the martian where it has a huge opening weekend and i think that that expanded to more audiences that people realize this is a good film to take your family to this is a theater experience that you should want to have and then i looked at the walk because the walk is a movie that was expanding from imax into mm. into more theaters and it barely cracked the top 10 and i i really enjoyed the walk and i think that's another movie that you want to go see in the theater if you see it at all so those are the things that stood out to me but yeah pan it's just it's such a disappointment i don't want to see the movie and i feel bad for it yeah i think they should change the name to panned <laughs> that, that would be a little more truthful everyone i've talked to said they hated it and then no one went to go see it so i mean i i think it was a bad marketing decision for them to push the release of pan remember it was going to come out like seven months film. ago yeah and uh they had all these trailers out and i was ready to see it then and then they kept releasing more trailers and it got pushed and i think I think it was like one of those things where everyone was like, what happened to that movie? Oh, it's out now mixed with it's not that, you know, critically acclaimed of a film. So that equals ba bad word of mouth and critics giving it the thumbs down is like the kiss of death and certain, you know, no one's. A Plus, you have a lot of other amazing films playing. You have Sicario, you have The Walk, you have Black Mass, you have Martian, you have just Transylvania. You have all these other decisions to, to make. And if someone's like, ah, that movie's not that good. Or if it's just not hitting on any of like anybody's, you know, 
it's just no one wants to go see it, obviously. Well, I don't want to crush a movie either for its, its marketing <laughs> campaign being a little skewed because I like when movies appeal to more audiences than just one demographic. But Pan coming out, and if you want to take your kids to that or you go with a safer bet, clearly that's what parents did, and they took them to see Hotel Transylvania right. too, yeah. which again beat Pan. That's, that is shocking to me. Do you? Let me throw it to, to both of you guys. Here's a question I have. Is this result of Pan, is this a situation where there was something in here that really turned audiences off? Or was it there was just a lack of anything to turn audiences on and make them want to go? I, I, I'm, I think I'm on a different side than a lot of people because I never cared that much about Peter Pan. Like, yeah, yeah, it's cool he goes to Neverland. I don't like the movie Hook that much. I was disappointed when I saw that as a little kid. I don't care about Peter Pan. Everybody else was acting like, oh, yeah, P Peter Pan is back. This is going to be a huge movie. I just never really saw what the <laughs> appeal was. You know what? I'm with you on that. Like, I wasn't a big, like, freak out Peter Pan. I was just, When I was a kid, it was played by a girl on television, so that's the only thing that was Mary like, Martin, baby. Yeah, I was always like, it was played by a woman on TV. Um, but yeah, I was never like, when are they going to do the ultimate pan movie? I never felt like, <laughs> well, finally it's here. But in the same breath, I thought those uh, those trailers for it were really interesting. And I was, especially like a year ago when they started dropping them, I was like, this could be a really fun film. I just think for myself, it was like, oh, it's finally out. It felt like anticlimactic because I was told it was going to come out at one point. And then literally, um, I think it was a month before it was supposed to come out, they pulled it. Yeah. Well, that's why Batman versus Superman is going to fail. <laughs> I know, I'm, right? I'm kidding. I know. That <laughs> happens. But there's there's something like that that's already built in. It's a built-in worldwide audience. Yeah. Something like Pan, it was like, it's already like had this weird, unique take on it. Everything looked different and strange. So it was like, it was really, you know, anchoring itself on being a different and unique approach to Pan. I just, you know, I'm going to see it eventually, so. All right, what's next? As many of you know, actor Vin Diesel has been teasing his involvement in Inhumans for months, including bursting out Black Bolt, Black Bolt, Black Bolt in an interview with Esquire, and also posted this picture on his Facebook page back in December. Well, Diesel has added again when in a recent interview with io9, he said the following. I can totally be something else with Marvel. I think playing Groot only makes Marvel that much more excited, and me having my experience with Marvel, seeing how great they were, makes me more excited. We've heard a lot of talk about Marvel wanting to have me play a character that doesn't have my voice. So my voice is used for Groot, and my presence is used for the other character. Schnepp, is Diesel basically giving away that he's going to be playing Black Bolt in Inhumans, or could he be talking about someone else? He's obviously talking about someone else. I think so many people just misunderstand what Vin Diesel's talking about. He's playing Lockjaw, this little, this giant <laughs> dog that is a trans-dimensional. It can, like, if you stand next to this dog, it can beam you to another and place. Does he have a mustache or something? He's got a really lock cool... Yeah, lock yeah. Jaw, I was got like... He's very, a very huggable creature. No, he's definitely playing Black Bolt. There's no way around it. He's basically told you time and time again, if there's an Inhumans movie, he's playing Black Bolt. I couldn't think of any other character, actor... Who could play Black Bolt just because of the way he holds himself, his stature, the way he can talk well, and explain without words? To people, if, for people who aren't familiar with Black Bolt, when when Vin Diesel says, "Yeah, it's a character that's going to use my presence to stand in my voice," explain to people why that's significant. So Black Bolt in the Marvel universe is this character who is kind of like the leader of the in Inhumans. His brother Maximus is a crazy, power mad, freaker, freak out kind of guy. <laughs> but Black Bolt basically his power is that he, when he talks. He can destroy the entire city that he's standing. The bill is like his vocal cords are like resonate and will just destroy everything around. But it will him. level an entire city, yeah. not a building, not a yeah. house, a city. So he can, he, yeah. ha, he has to be silent. Like Roseanne singing the yeah. national anthem. <laughs> he had wow. to, he had to be trained to be quiet his entire childhood. So uh, that's that's why uh, with someone like Vin Diesel who can carry himself and say with just a look say so many things. He's a great actor, so he can carry that within his face. So I think that's why he was able to, you know, hey, look, you'll be Groot, and then you'll also be Black Bolt, so you get to talk and be physically there, too. So Yeah, this is, I mean, this is blatant. I mean, I yeah. can't imagine who else. Like, he's <laughs> he's trying, he put up pictures of himself saying, are you inhuman, and in interviews going, Black Bolt, Black Bolt. Like, yeah, he's going to play Black Bolt. I mean, that makes sense, and you're right. This is, when you think about Black Bolt, Vin Diesel's physical presence and the way he would carry himself would be perfect. Mm -hmm. He would be great as Black Bolt. And when you know you read into the stuff about how he's had to mentally train himself and all that kind of stuff, 
that strong silent. I'm curious as to see what they're going to use in, like I know what they do in the comics, but what are they going to do in the film medium for how he communicates? That's going to be really interesting. So, and, you know, throughout the history of the comic books, he's been, you know, a prize, a target of the Kree and a lot, wanting to use him like as a living weapon of mass destruction mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Now, how that's all going to tie into what's going on with the television universe, we don't know. There was a nonsensical report that went around I have to at least address this because so many of you guys are tweeting us about it. There was this total BS story going around that uh, I believe it came from Bleeding Cool saying, oh, uh, Marvel is ditching uh, the Inhumans movie. It's total nonsense, total BS. Don't believe a word of that. Uh, it, this movie is moving forward. Don't believe anything else. It's just ask Vin Diesel if it's happening. So anyway, Mark, what's your reaction to all this? Uh, kids, there's three things that are certain, okay? Death, taxes, and Vin Diesel's Facebook posts, all right? <laughs> this is what you should put your faith in because if he posted, I love that Vin Diesel, he's like a huge star, and he's still at home on Photoshop making like, you know, you're more human, inhuman. It's, right. it's exciting to me that he's th this excited about it. Yeah. And there was another big dude that was in the Fast and Furious that teased his character in a comic book universe too when The Rock kept hinting at what he might do be in the DCU coming up and so now Vin Diesel pretty much taking a play out of that book it makes total sense that he's playing Black Bolt and it's something to get excited for and for a project like in humans where a lot of lay people don't know as much about this property as they do the Avengers or anything else that the Marvel is universe is doing cinematically this is exciting this is like the first step and oh this is going to be a giant production on a par with what Marvel's been doing all right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? In a recent discussion with Vanity Fair, Star Wars Episode Seven director J.J. Abrams revealed that his contract for the film technically gives him final cut on the film. He acknowledges that when you do a Disney project, there's a clause in there that you kind of go, well, if I were a lawyer, I could probably drive a truck <laughs> through it. He also went on to say the following. I cannot say enough about how Bob Iger and Alan Horn have understood this thing that is now part of the Disney company. Abrams added, and they're not trying to Disneyify it. They're not doing anything other than, I think, an incredibly smart thing, which is letting Kathleen Kennedy, who is a remarkable person and producer, run and lead Lucasfilm to a place where I think it wants to go. John Byers said that J.J. Abrams actually has final cut on Star Wars Episode 7. Um, I'm going to say the really unpopular thing here and say I sell that he has final edit, and I wouldn't want him to have true, you know, above all else authority final edit on this film. Why? Because this is the first film in a new series, and he's only going to be there for one of them. And I want the people to have who I want the people to have final say that are going to be here for the whole thing. And that's Kathleen Kennedy. And I think that J.J. Abrams is kind of saying that in, in this in many ways. He said, "Look, yeah, in my contract I have final edit, but this is Disney, <laughs> which means they get the contract can say whatever you want it to say. Disney will have final say." But then what I thought was really revealing is when he talked about Kathleen Kennedy. He's saying, "Look, Iger and Horn, who are two very smart dudes." Iger and Horn seem to be putting all their trust in Kathleen Kennedy. I think the real person in charge here is Kathleen Kennedy, and I think that's the way it should be. She's going to be shepherding this entire franchise, from the episodes to the anthologies to everything else. She's the person in charge. You need one person who's like, the buck stops here on all these kinds of things. And she, trust me, she still has to answer to Horn and Iger. Absolutely she does. Remember, she wanted to move Star Wars off the December date into 2016, and uh, Iger went, Nah, no, you're going to do it in December. Thank you, Bob, by the way. Um, so I, what I really think what, jo, what JJ is saying here is I think JJ is saying the real person in charge here is Kathleen, and she's probably letting him have all his creative freedom at the same time. This looks like a really healthy, functioning studio production relationship where you do have the ultimate guys in charge who can be the buck stops here and say, nope, you're not doing that in the head studio heads, but they are c handling that power correctly with the way they're dealing with Kathleen Kennedy, who is handling her relationship correctly with J.J. Abrams, who with J.J. who's then being allowed to do his thing. There's checks and balances. This looks like the model for a healthy functioning production workflow mm. if I've ever seen it and I it just makes me even more excited to be honest Mark what do you think and I hope it continues to be the model of how you make a giant production like this because the less we hear about contracts and lawyers and what would hold up in court the better I, I don't want that to be the reality I want the reality to continue to be X-Wings and lightsabers and Wookiees that's what I believe in J.J. Abrams I don't think has Final Cut even in his contract even though he is producing all of the new trilogy correct so he's gonna be he's gonna have some say in what goes into 
all of those films. But you're right. I think Kathleen Kennedy is the person where the buck finally stops. J.J. Abrams has full creative control to make his movie. And then he's going to do the cut as he sees fit. And then Kathleen Kennedy is going to lay her eyes on it and just just maybe give some notes. But I mm -hmm. think that her and J.J. are so on the same page and have been since they met uh, you know, three years ago to mm -hmm. talk about this that I think we're going to get the movie that everybody wants to release. Now, this just came out on Twitter. J.J. Abrams says, there was a cut of this movie that I was really proud to show you guys a year ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> we're probably... Uh, <laughs> oh, Boo. no, that's a different movie. Boo. I'm sorry. Different hey, movie. Different you know what? Guy. I think, like, when George Lucas met with Kathleen Kennedy to turn over the keys to her... You know that 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 she's in charge of the Star Wars universe as we see it. She's the one who who said, "Look, we're not going to go forward with that that video game that was going to be all like the dungeons of you know Coruscant with the the villains and the cartels like level one two three or whatever it was called." Um, they canceled the the comedy animated detours because they were like, "Look, we want people to take Star Wars seriously again. Like, we can't keep making fun of all of our characters. That's a joke right now." So they made a conscious effort to reform the idea of what a Star Wars movie could be before even J.J. Abrams got hired. So even even he had he came in with a script that was already written and then that him and Lawrence Kazan rewrote it. So there's a lot of that a lot of JJ's footprint is going to be in this movie. Oh, absolutely. Not only as a writer, not only as a producer, as a director. And I do believe he has a version of Final Cut. Not like the Apple Final Cut <laughs> editing, but a version of Final Cut whereas like some directors when they say we I have Final Cut, that means that it's like lock print you know, it goes right to the movie theaters. This is a this is my final cut. Do you want to change anything? Or like, I think it's a discussion of final cut. But I gotta believe that that those discussions that you're talking about, and I think you're nailing it. I think those discussions will happen before JJ gets to that end edit. Mm. I oh, think totally. JJ's a smart enough guy, and Kathleen is smart yes. enough. Iger and, that they're all having these discussions ongoing. So by the time they get to that point where JJ's ready to say this is the final edit. I think he's already gotten all the input from all the other people because you're right. I mean, yeah. that's just the way to handle it right, and they seem to yeah. be doing that's that. That's the best way to handle any large production is like, it's not like, you know, some king, like, it's my final cut. It's like, we've all agreed that this is the final cut, and then they sign off. It's on. it's the way that Pixar makes a lot of their movies, too. I have the yes. opportunity to be up yes. at yes. Pixar, yeah. and they a lot of times they sit in a room. First of all, Pixar, a lot of their projects use multiple directors, and then they have all the producers in there as well, and right. so everybody that is involved in the production is in there, and they sit in this room, and they all go around the room, and they start talking talking about, oh, I like this, I didn't like this. So it's a very collective unit, yeah. as opposed to having somebody that is just George Lucas, whereas if he was still involved in Lucasfilm, he would have Final Cut. But that's not the case anymore. Kathleen Kennedy has a lot of his power, but it's still going to be a collective decision as to what actually hits theater. I think his thing would be called Avid Cut. But <laughs> I think what you're talking about, it's actually a technical term for it. It's called the Chime Squad, where everyone just <laughs> chimes in and it just gets thrown in. It's the Chime Squad. And it's you're right. That is the way Pixar... They, they do these films by committee, which is, I mean, hey, you can't argue with their results. Right. All right, what's next? Although the most recent Expendables film, Expendables 3, only managed to generate a measly $39 million <laughs> at the domestic box office, it did manage to pull in over $167 million overseas. As a result, Variety is now reporting that Expendables 4 is indeed on the way and is tentatively planned to shoot in 2016 for a 2017 release date. Mark, buy or sell a fourth Expendables film. What? what I is mean, that picture? I, first of all, I buy the pick. I don't know if that was Ray or Vin Diesel that made that on Photoshop, but it's tremendous. I uh, am going to have to buy the movie because I'm a guy of a certain age and I want to see as many Expendables movies as they can, provided that Stallone maybe looks at Expendables 3 and says, yeah, some of us did mail that movie in. The new talent in Expendables 3 really committed, like Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford. Some of the guys that have been there a while were just kind of going through the motions. So if we can rectify that, I want to see as many Expendables films as we could possibly have Will they make money? Will it do better than the third one? I don't know. I thought the third one had a pretty strong marketing campaign going into it, and so I was, I was surprised at how poorly it did at the box office, but internationally, if it's making those kind of numbers, I'm going to get my wish and see a fourth one. I want to find out if Ray has an inside source <laughs> at the studio that Hulk Hogan's appearance movie where he just <laughs> randomly decided to drop him in there like a bomb. I had no idea. That was anyway, um, I buy it, and the reason I buy it is this. Look, I Expendables 1 had potential, but kind of faltered, I think. I loved, unabashed, I loved Expendables 2. I had so much fun. Expendables 3 was a step backwards, it was. There were certain elements to it that Mel Gibson was great in it. It had certain elements to it that worked. Sylvester Stallone has said, making, and he's come right out and said this, making Expendables 3 PG-13 was a mistake. 
He said, I won't make that mistake again if we do it, if we do another one. And the fact is overseas and made a ton of money, made a lot of money. And these movies are not, by Hollywood standards, all that expensive to make. Them coming back, hearing Stallone saying he's learning lessons from the mistakes they made, wanting to move forward. Yeah, I mean, these... These Expendables movies are the pure definition of dumb fun. <laughs> they totally are. And it seems like when Sylvester Stallone is tuned really into that, that's when it really works best, like in number two. And I think we're going to see more of that in the fourth one. But going back to Radar, he also said, look, going Radar means we got to kill some people off. Right. You know, that, that'll be interesting. Just to see. not Wesley Snipes. I loved him in <laughs> Expendables 3. Let's keep Wesley around for a little bit. All right. I want five F bombs within the first minute and somebody's <laughs> head exploding <laughs> right away before the credits. Just like, like, secure the, the R rating. <laughs> secure it. Just do that for me, Stallone. Yeah, I'm excited about this news, too. I mean, Expendables, I, I agree with the Expendables 2 is my favorite. If there's some way to work Chuck Norris back in, I know he's a weirdo. He's like, I can't be in it unless I'm a star, whatever. <laughs> Norris, stop being weird. You're doing Stepmaster or whatever it is, a shake weight. I don't know what you're selling now. Get into back into Expendables 4. We miss you. So. I tell you, I'll never forget. And I, I'm, not, I'm trying, not trying to go into any political stuff here at all. <laughs> but during the last presidential le election, though, I'll never forget seeing Chuck Norris. Like, oh, you wacky nut job. Yeah, <laughs> you're so a, gr I love you anyway. What a weirdo. But him, yeah. and his, him and his wife doing this political campaign advertisement saying, and I, I kid you not, look this up. He goes, a second Obama administration would lead America into a thousand years of darkness. Uh, he did say that. He but did say yeah. that. <laughs> I hope hopefully Expendables 4 gets like Jesse Ventura in because they already got Arnold. They got all these dudes who are political and stuff and just blow all of them up. Yeah, know? I don't think Jesse looks like he didn't Predator anymore, but no, still be interesting. He's got the mouth. Ain't so. got time to bleed. Make up with Carl Weathers, too. Get Carl Weathers <laughs> yeah. in there. We want Carl Weathers it, in something. Did they have beef? Does they, Stallone they have Weathers beef? Have because beef? I think Carl Weathers wanted to come back in Rocky Five as like a Force Ghost situation. This is what I heard. <laughs> and <laughs> or like a flashback, and, and that Stallone didn't want him in there. And, you know, so he just they just didn't really talk ever since. Now the Creed's coming in. I don't think Carl Weathers is going to have a flashback in Creed either. Uh -huh. So it might be another 20 years of upset angst, but I would love to see Carl Weathers. I think he's earned a shot to be an Expendables. Player. Come on, Sly. If Adam Sandler can put Carl Weathers in his movies, why can't you? <laughs> All right, what's next? Director Brian Singer's upcoming X-Men film, X-Men Apocalypse, may still be over seven months away, but that hasn't stopped him from already having a first cut of the film complete. When talking about the cut and how long the new film may end up being, Singer said the following. The cut's a little long right now, but I think it's going to be a longer X-Men movie. The X-Men movies I usually keep under two hours, but this one I may actually let be a longer movie because it's sort of a wrap-up of six movies. It's kind of a wrap-up of X-Men 1, 2, 3, Three, first Class, Days of Future Past, and there's even an homage at the end, a scene. It's going to get spoiled because they decided to use it in the trailer, which comes out in like six months, but it's a really cool trailer. But it's kind of a wrap-up of six movies, so it might run a little bit longer. Schnepp, would you buy or sell a longer X-Men Apocalypse film? I will, uh, I'll buy it. And I, I like that at least Singer is letting us know because they always do this in every movie now. They show you the ending somehow. <laughs> started doing it with Men in Black. I remember where they showed the giant spaceship and they were like, that very last shot with it coming at him, mm -hmm. you're like, that's the end of the movie. You know, so at least he's letting us know there's going to they're going to show you a little bit of it, but it's a longer scene and we're wrapping it up. So, you know, don't be freaked out if you see that. And I'd love it to be longer. I think all of his movies, especially his return with X-Men Days of Future Past was incredible. And it was a return to form like how he did X-Men 1 and the incredible X-Men 2, X2. It's, so I'm very excited that he's here to wrap up. <laughs> this uh, six trilogy, what's it, six tuplets, or what is it called? If there's six of them, a sex tuplet, sex tuplet. Sex tuplet. So you know, so I just wanted to say sex. Yeah, I mean, Sextology. I mean, I guess, but you can't really, you can't use the last stand really. So it's actually only five movies, a Cinco de Mayo or whatever you want to call it. So I, I don't think it's Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. I don't think that's the term. You know, I'm going to call it the Cinco de Mayo. It's coming out in May, right, guys? Um. So anyway, I'm excited about it. I can't wait for this movie to come out. I don't mind if it's four hours. I cannot wait to see it. Yeah. If this was another, let's say this was. Peter Jackson, who, look, I'm a big Peter Jackson fan, everybody knows that, but Peter Jackson has never been introduced to an editing machine. <laughs> like, Peter Jackson is like, everything I put to frame is gold and needs to be in my movies. Give me my four and a half hour cut. Brian Singer's a different kind of director. Like, even when he had great stuff, like, I don't know if you guys have seen X-Men Days of Future Past, the Rogue cut, but you know, he, look, he had great stuff. But he is a very self-conscious editor, and he will cut his own stuff out if he thinks it makes his movie slimmer, leaner, meaner, and have better impact to great effect. 
And since it's a director like that, who we've seen is totally willing to cut his own stuff to give you know what he thinks is the best theatrical presentation, then when that director says to me, oh, can't Michael Long in this one, I trust him. Because this he's not a everything I shoot has to be on screen kind of director. He's proven he's totally willing to pair his own stuff, even take really good stuff out to make a leaner, meaner movie. And if he says, yeah, I might go long on this one, I'm totally in. If this goes three hours, I just believe because it's Brian Singer, it's going to feel like a lean, trim three hours. Yeah. So let's give it to us, Brian. Just bring it on. Yeah, even putting the artistic stuff aside for a minute, I would buy this <laughs> simply because I want more mutants. I want more X-Men. And when you're talking about this, might be the last time we see a lot of them on screen in their form. This is the last time we see Wolverine from Hugh Jackman in an X-Men movie. I will wear the NASCAR suit that lets me pee in it because I do not want to leave the theater. <laughs> I want this to be four and a half, five hours. I just want more x-men now creatively is that the best decision to make to make a movie three hours i don't know i don't know what the story you're telling is yet but it seems like it's on a grand scale those tend to lead themselves to being longer movies there's a crap ton of mutants in here so we're gonna need some running time i'm all on board especially when like you said john brian singer's the guy in charge of it i'll sign up for that all right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime to collidervideo at gmail.com, and we'll see if we can get your question on the show. So, Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Dustin J. Hawks writes, I just read an article about Brian Cranston wanting to play a super villain role in a Marvel film. With the lackluster villains that the MCU has had to this point, Loki, Red Skull, and Ultron excluded, do you think this is a good move for Cranston? It seems Marvel puts far less significance on villains unless they will be playing a larger role throughout the cinematic timeline, Loki Thanos. Yeah, that has always been, like everybody knows I'm a big, massive fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but one of their weaknesses has traditionally been that they don't have real super, like they don't have their Darth Vader, they don't have their Hans Gruber, they don't have their real pinnacle um, villains, other than, say, Loki, who has a long-running theme throughout the cinematic films. And I like the Red Skull, too. So would that make, and to be more specific, Brian Cranston said in New York that he'd like to play, you know, a, a villain in a big superhero film. And then in another panel, I believe it was the second panel that he came out and said, you know what, let me tell you, I want to play Mr. Sinister. Which, you know, for those of you who don't know, Mr. Sinister is a fantastic villain in the X-Men universe. So that kind of removes him from the running for doing something in Marvel. But remember, this is just Brian Cranston talking off the top right. of his head. This is not him saying he's going to play it. And, you know, every big Hollywood star right now wants to be in a Marvel or big DC film. So, of course, they want to play those roles. This isn't going to create anything happening. But Brian Cranston playing a Mr. Sinister... Yeah, sign me up. If that was going to happen, I would be doing a little dance. I, I think he would be perfect. Is he a little old for it? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's Mr. Sinister. If you know anything about the character, it don't matter. Uh, Cranston playing that, I would be super stoked for it. Mark, what about you? Yeah, so would I. And I, I would I would argue that it wasn't necessarily off the top of his head. It sounds no, like true. something that's that true. maybe he was thinking about for a little bit because he played to the <clears> crowd <throat> afterwards, which a lot of stars do at something like Comic-Con when they're like, well, you want to see me play Mr. Sinister? Right. And the crowd goes crazy. So it sounds like something that might be a little calculated. I'm not telling you to take this to the bank. He's definitely playing Mr. Sinister. But it clearly is something that he has been rolling around in his head. Maybe they've had some exploratory talks. I don't know how far down the line it is but i would love to see brian cranston in the mcu because as great of a villain as loki is remember as as, as sinister though it wouldn't be mcu uh, that, uh, that, that's right it'd be fox right, it'd be that's fox. right but it, when you're talking about any of these movies that are marvel based productions loki is a loki's a great character i don't even look at him that much as a villain anymore because yeah he kind of he, he's there and we love him to death but he's not like that that menacing villain that you're really waiting for in a movie like that so maybe mr sinister over at fox could be it yeah, at least he didn't say, hey, what about me playing Dr. Sinister? Like, actors get it all wrong. They've never read a comic book in their life. And it's like, oh, you know, don't just pander. But yeah, I, I truly believe he would be great as any supervillain in any of the Marvel movies. Yeah, Marvel uh, proper, the cinematic universe, is missing some of their big heavy hitters. Dr. Doom and Magneto are over at Fox. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, they. but I wouldn't say that they're skimping. I mean, Red Skull, Loki, you got Thanos. I mean, they've got a lot of big big heavy hitters coming up. They might have misfired a few times and just didn't concentrate and, and make the villains the main focal point for some of the, like Thor Dark World. Some of them weren't as strong yeah. or memorable as they should have or could have been. Ant-Man. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they're like, hey, meet my doppelganger. Fight this the one that's me that looks just like me. So, I think that's, uh, you know, they, we've seen that happen and I think with what, you know, Feige just announced Ant-Man and the Wasp and all these like three mystery movies, we don't know what they're going to be. There's a lot that, you know, 
Cranston, Cranston can easily fit in there. Or if he is going to be Mr. Sinister, maybe they're going to fit him into Gambit. We don't know. So I think All it's right. a great call. What's next? Jonathan Peck writes, Hey, Collider crew, big fan of your show. I have never missed an episode. My Me question either. surrounds Brad Bird. <laughs> this guy has put on A-plus films like Iron Giant, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, and even his first live action film, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Until Tomorrowland came out, which I was excited about at the time, it got mixed reviews. I know his next film would be The Incredibles 2, which I am excited about. My point is, should Brad Bird direct a live action film again after The Incredibles 2? Absolutely, he should. Absolutely. And here's the thing about Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrowland is one of these films that had massive expectation and didn't live up to the expectation. And when it doesn't live up to the expectation, we sometimes interpret that as poor. Look, was, was Tomorrowland the film I wanted it to be? No. But was it a bad film? I still contend that no, it was not a bad film. It just didn't come anywhere near the potential that that movie had. That movie looked gangbusters. Mm -hmm. The trailers I thought were fantastic. The cast was great. The premise sounded incredible. You had uh, Brad Bird directing it. I mean, this thing was positioned to be like in our top 10 favorite films of the year kind of thing. What did it end up being? I remember Christian and I did, the, did a review for it here and we both like gave it a seven out of 10. So, but I mean, that's not as good as it should have been. It should have been a nine. It should have been an 8.5. Ends up being seven, which is still not bad. So I, to, in my opinion, Brad Bird is still batting a thousand, to be honest with you, because I still do not consider Tomorrowland a failure. I thought it was a disappointment because it was nowhere, nowhere near as good as I was hoping it would be. But when you really sit back at and just look at it on its own merits for what it is, forget expectation, it's not a bad little movie. It just could have been much more. So understanding, as you point out in your email, that even before that, he did that uh, Mission Impossible film, which we all agree he crushed, mm -hmm. totally crushed that. So I would love to see him go back and forth between live action and animation. I really hope after Incredibles 2, and please God, get that done. Then I want to see him do another live action film. Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, I mean, the only disappointment that I have, yeah, I think he's an incredible director, like, is that The Incredibles 2 isn't coming out until 2019. Did you, <laughs> yeah, that's, like, too that. long, man. Come on. Like, so instead of him directing a live-action thing after, he could, like, fit in, like, at least three movies beforehand. You're going to have a lot of time. I hope he's recording Craig T. Nelson's lines now. Yeah, just get everybody <laughs> recorded. I'm sure, like, most animations, get everybody in the can. You got all that time to do animation and go make three more movies. I, I, I disagree a little bit with you. I think... Uh, Tomorrowland was like three different movies combined into one, mm. and those three movies, one of them sucked, and the other, the other one was good, and the other one was incredible. So there was like, it was very uneven in tone, and I loved certain parts of it, and then other parts were like, what the hell is going on? And then other parts, I'm like, stop this movie, you know? So <laughs> it kept going like that for me. Uh, is that all the director's fault? No, it's the writer, the producer, the whole team. They just, they weren't able to craft it so it, it felt like one cohesive film. Henceforth, it was a failure critically and financially. It just, it didn't connect with people. And all of us wanted to love Tomorrowland. I know that for a fact. It's like, wow, it's like not only could it become a brand new cool ride, but I just thought even the design sensibility of Tomorrowland was all over the place. Like some of it was incredibly cool and retro and this, but then other parts of it were like, why are those giant robots that look like toys in there? And the, there's just certain things, you know, it, I would say see it. It doesn't, it's not a horrible film. And some parts are so incredibly inventive and fun. It's definitely not like don't av avoid it. It's one of those, it's just, a, it's just not like, <laughs> It, it isn't Mission Impossible 4. It isn't the Iron Giant. It isn't even Ratatouille, which all of us forgot he made because it was we love Ratatouille and we were just talking oh about that. God. I was like, so good. We, I, we had to double check. Like, he was like, yeah, he directed it. I was like, what? And he was like, there's two directors. He came in and kind of like helped shape it towards the end. So he definitely directed it or redirected it or however you want to call it. But, you know, his imprint when it's on a film is big and massive and vast. Maybe not so much so with Tomorrowland. It's just like a little bit of like <laughs> didn't hit it out of the park. It's like, you know, third base or something. So. But, you know, I, I can't wait for Incredibles 2. I say get him in on as many projects as possible, you know? Yeah, I mean, I want to see him stick with live action, actually, because we know we're getting the Incredibles 2 at some point. So I want to see what he can do, because there's a lot of great filmmaking in Tomorrowland. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the end of it, this is how I felt watching Tomorrowland. It's my, my, my throat got froggy. I got emotional. <laughs> because it was a different movie. It was, like, it was almost like the studio came in and said, hey, you know what? We want to tell the kids to recycle instead of close out the movie that we had. So, you know, 
that's that's my take on it. All right, Thank what's you. next? Ryan <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> hey guys, big fan of the show. Watched it daily to get my nerd slash movie fix. My question is, what happened to the weekend mailbags? I know that John puts an extra time on the weekends to do them, but it's been two weeks since Dennis pre-recorded mailbags, and I feel like it hasn't even been what mentioned. What happened? <laughs> Just hoping to know what's up. Again, thanks for all your hard work. God, it's falling apart, Campia. What <laughs> happened? Listen uh, to this yeah, kid. So, um, actually, if you follow me on social media, I tell people all the time, if you want to be kept up to date with what's going on with a lot of behind the scenes stuff you gotta be following me on twitter so just a little follow me on twitter at john can that simple because i did talk about it and i did announce it both times here's what's going on some people also mentioned that you know oh why was there heroes once again if you follow me on twitter you would know why there was no heroes this past week um <clears throat> i'll start with mailbag with mailbag okay ever since we moved into the new studio here we have often talked about the fact that despite the fact that we are an internet company doing internet shows, we have no internet in the studio, which is, which is really rather odd. Um, there is no company that services this building and that if we were ever going to get any of the companies to service this building, it was going to cost us an upfront cost of $30,000 to run it in and uh, to get the line in here. So um, what basically happened was we found a company that could bring internet because we've just been using these um, 4G LTE boxes in here. And those do not provide very good service. It's okay, Wendy, just walk on through. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you went the wrong way. Just, just, pass, just pass it through, just pass it through, just pass it through. I think it's for Mark. Yes, it is. We don't have internet, but we do have water. <laughs> we do have water. In a um, Wookiee mug. <clears throat> Thank so, you, Wendy. <laughs> Um, so basically what happened, we've been using these Sprint LT 4G boxes that do not cut it. Anyway, we found a company that could service the building here. And we've been in this process, this long, unbelievably painful process of getting internet in here. Now, when we learned we were going to be getting internet, I changed what mailbag was going to be. We're going to be doing mailbag a little bit differently. And I'm excited for you guys to see it. But it required us having internet. And you'll see why when we actually start doing mailbags this way. And then it wasn't going to happen. It, like it was supposed to be in two weeks ago. And it never came about. So it's like I was prepared to do it this other way. We couldn't do it. Okay, so we scrapped it. But no problem because we were going to get internet this week. Two more technician visits. Still no internet. The day before we were, I was supposed to shoot mailbags again. And once again, we had no internet. On top of the fact, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, I got really sick this past weekend. So I was... I was laid up this past week and we weren't having the internet, so I wasn't prepared to do the show the old way, and so we had to cancel it again. But it's coming this weekend. The new and improved mailbag is coming this weekend. Regarding heroes, <coughs> it was a mixture of things. Um, as many of you know, we have started up six new shows for television recaps and reviews. And that has kept us really freaking busy, like unbelievable, like working here around the clock. Like we're here from like 8 a.m. till about 11.30 p.m. And Heroes came up and it's like, I, I, I was going to host Heroes because Schnepp was out of town in New York. And it was like, we are so slammed and so busy right now. And Schnepp's not here. He's in New York. And we said, you know what? We'll wait till Schnepp comes back because Heroes is Schnepp's baby. We, we love it when he's hosting it. And so we thought, you know what? <coughs> we'll just wait for him to get back. So that's why there's no heroes, and I mentioned all that on my Facebook or on my uh, Twitter, and that's why there haven't been any mailbags, but it is coming. We're getting internet in here. Lots of great things coming. You guys want to add anything? I am shocked you didn't notice once that it was me and Schnepp dressed up as internet technicians. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody yeah. ever called the internet people. It was just sucks. Yeah, I just took off my fake beard, and <laughs> yeah, so, so stop complaining about no, no heroes. Don't write any more stuff about it. In fact, people were coming up to me while I was in New York on Thursday. They like, what's up, dude? How come you're not on mailbag? What happened to Heroes? I'm like, dude, I'm in New York. I'm here. I'm standing, I'm standing right, right, right in front of you. Looking around. I was like, didn't you see that you follow me? I was like, remember I was in Toronto on Tuesday. <laughs> I was like, just chill. The, this coming Tuesday, tomorrow is going to be an extra long, sweaty edition of Heroes with all the New York Comic Con coverage. So it's going to be awesome. So relax. We got you. 
All right, so that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here on my left, back from Toronto and New York Comic Con, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Thank God. I'm okay. I didn't get the con <laughs> crud. It was awesome seeing everyone in New York. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp, at TDOS. SLWH, and you guys can come to Stan Lee's Kamikaze. That's the big convention that's coming up at the end of October. All of us here from Movie Talk will be there. We've got a panel coming up on that Sunday, uh, November 1st at Stan Lee's Kamikaze, Los Angeles Convention Center. I'll also be screening The Death of Superman Lives, what happened the entire film there, so get your tickets. It's going to be sweaty. It's going to be awesome. Of course, over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? <laughs> Ah, when I'm not <laughs> drinking my Wookiee juice, you can find me. This Saturday, I'll be headlining Hypno Comedy. If you're in Southern California, check it out. I'll tweet out the information at 5150Ls, Twitter and Instagram. And, of course, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find if you? I make it out of here alive with you sickos over here. Give me the answer. You can find me on Twitter yeah. and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And, of course, you can find me on social media. Follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye.